Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming out. Um, before we begin, we'd like to take a little time to talk about Kina and outline our goals with the project. In order to better situate the films that we're going to watch tonight, Isaac has prepared a little talk for us that contextualizes our project within the wider world of experimental cinema. And we hope this is informative as to why we created the site and what we hope to achieve in the future. Great, uh, thanks Michelle. So I think it's best to begin with the first question that's obviously raised, which is, what is Kina? Uh, basically, it's a website, Kurt Walker, Michelle and I run, that releases small programs of experimental films and film writing online every few months. Uh, we usually describe Kina as an online platform for experimental cinema, which is usually understood as something akin to a publisher or something like an online music label. Uh, basically a localized space for a group of films we think benefit from being seen together. Uh, while this description gets the gist uh, of what we're doing, we progressively come to realize that in describing our project this way, we run into a host of questions about the very nature of such a project in the first place. Many of these questions and our attempts to answer them have shaped both Keenan's development and what we've understood ourselves to be doing at various stages of the project. Part of what we'd like to do today is address a few of, the, of these questions that a project like Keenan poses by virtue of its very existence, and then talk about the ways the films we just shown, or the films we're going to show, uh, factor in this ever-changing definition. So any sort of project that claims to be able to make judgments on the value of art necessarily faces certain criticisms regarding its standards and criteria for making these judgments. Uh, what makes this work have value as opposed to this other work? How is this value defined? What gives you the authority to make this judgment in the first place? When we think about it, every judgment on the value of an artwork is something of an implicit answer to questions such as these. The very authority we grant an art institution to be able to make these judgments is grounded in the adequacy or inadequacy of the reasons it provides for making the claims it does. Our coming to accept uh, an art institution's reasons as authoritative in this regard is a social process. We collectively bestow authority on an institution because we recognize its judgments as somewhat faithfully representing the general consensus. For example, an art museum would be hard-pressed to attract visitors if its standards were generally thought to be arbitrary. Its authority in this matter relies on our recognition that these standards accurately reflect our shared historical idea of what, kind of art has, what kinds of art has value. Of course, an art institution is more than just a passive servant to consensus, but its role in forming these standards must allow for influences from the outside. If an art institution's standards are not in constant negotiation with the general consensus, they will be left to stagnate, and the institution will lose whatever authority it previously had. It cannot just impose these standards from the top down and expect anyone to listen. Now, much of what I've just described may seem like an arduous and overly fine-grained analysis of something that sort of goes without saying. But my point in doing this is to make explicit our own often obscure role in shaping the value systems upheld by art institutions. It's only by first doing this that we can bring to light the ways in which the very notion of curation can, and often does, fail to serve the best interests of the art form it wishes to cultivate. We've chosen to highlight this because it is this failure that Keenan ventures to correct and was in many ways the impetus behind starting this project. In our ventures into the world of experimental cinema, we were met with institutional values that we felt were misaligned with the contemporary needs of the art form. In approaching this issue from many different angles, it became apparent that this misalignment was due in large part to the institutions in question failing to allow, to allow influence from outside their own bubble. Now, as far as contemporary experimental cinema is concerned, the primary institution we recognize as having the authority in assigning our work value is the film festival. By virtue of its own definition, a film festival is supposed to recognize films that are representative of the forefront of the art form. But in order for it to be considered successful, its value systems need to keep up with the changing standards of the day. And speaking of film festivals in general, their adequacy in this regard is supposedly guaranteed by the simple fact that a film festival is a market institution. The films selected are those that are seen as having the best chance of getting distribution based on their potential to attract an audience. In a market-driven society, this is taken the best represent what we collectively want. At the end of the day, it's the conflation of market viability with the desires of the moviegoer 
that supports the festival's authority in giving certain arts value over others. Now, experimental film aside, there's of course much to critique about placing this authority in the so-called invisible hand of the market. But for brevity's sake, I think it best to narrow our focus down to the specific ways in which market dynamics consistently fail experimental cinema. Obviously, experimental films occupy a very different place within the film market than larger productions. But based on the way these films are seen and distributed, this difference seems to have gone largely unobserved by those in charge. When we're dealing with feature films, the festival circuit is something of a test market. The goal for these films is to be eventually seen by larger audiences outside of the festival. However, this is far from the case when it comes to experimental works, which in most cases find their largest audiences at the festival itself, making festival screenings something of an end goal if you're looking to get your films seen. Market value simply doesn't operate the same way for experimental films as it does for commercial features. Now you'd think that given this incompatibility with traditional market value, we would not allow our value systems for experimental cinema to be determined by it. However, what we see is quite the opposite. Instead of readjusting our value systems to suit these film-specific needs, we see the forced imposition of a market dynamic on them. I find this forced imposition of market dynamics to be best exemplified by the manufactured scarcity so prevalent within experimental cinema today, i.e., the fact that despite the relative ease with which these films can be made available to everyone through the internet, they are often only shared privately between critics and programmers, making them basically inaccessible to anyone who doesn't live where these festivals take place or lacks the money required for a ticket. It basically boils down to the fact that making these films hard to see is the only way for the filmmakers to make any money. Although this logic is somewhat upended by the fact that many large film festivals don't pay external filmmakers at all for their contributions. I find this aspect of the experimental film market to be absolutely detrimental to the progression of the art form, for the reason that only a very small group of people even have access to what is currently going on in the experimental cinema, what its concerns are, what's been done, what hasn't, where you or I could make a contribution. Making art is a process of building upon past foundations, of weaving in the new with the old. How is an art form meant to progress if its current concerns are inaccessible to most every single one of its potential contributors? Moreover, how is something experimental, that is something meant to challenge convention, to be expected to function if the convention itself is unknowable to most of its would-be practitioners? This system is vulnerable to stasis. This is part of the reason that much contemporary experimental cinema feels outdated. By willfully keeping these films unseen, the criteria by which these films were chosen in the first place also retreats from view. Hiding the standards for judging these films leads to the standards becoming more and more insular over time. Earlier we outlined the ways an art institution's authority depends on the collective recognition that the institution accurately represents our standards. But as we've seen with the insular nature of experimental film programming, this couldn't be further from the case. How can we take them to represent these collective values if their own value system permits little to no influence from the outside? In the past, perhaps this growing rift between value systems would be difficult to pinpoint and begrudgingly accepted as a necessary evil inherent to any sort of taste-making enterprise. But the rise of the internet has brought this gap as it exists in experimental cinema into sharp relief when compared to most other art forms. When you look at the rise of something like YouTube stars, musicians who have developed their followings on SoundCloud, or any other number of similar internet phenomenons, we can see that the necessity for creation is beginning to waver. In these areas, at least, it would seem that the collective consensus has begun to find ways to express itself without the need of a middleman directing the flow of content. Value is beginning to be determined by the sheer quantity of people who independently confer it. While this need for curation or localization would seem to be progressively ceding to the autonomy of new media, we do still think some form of localization is necessary. After all, we wouldn't be here presenting this group of films if we thought otherwise. This raises another question. What purpose does this localization serve? Our answer to this question has taken many forms over the years and will continue to change in the future. In much the same way our standards are always changing, so too should our methods of withholding them. At this point in time, we feel that in localizing these works, we are providing a space where they can enter into a dialogue with one another, where many different and emerging tendencies, no matter how disparate, can flourish by virtue of their belonging to one single set. In many cases, our understanding of what curation entails in the world of experimental cinema has begun to shift to something like the curator's artist, with their selection of films determined not by these films' individual merits, 
Although I haven't all they fit into or express a given theme chosen by the curator. While this may make for neat and tidy experimental film programs, doesn't this type of curation inhibit variety by its own definition? In making it so that a work must conform to a theme in order to have value in the eyes of a film festival, the body of possibility in our field is slowly rendered monolithic. If I were an aspiring filmmaker and I were to go to one of these festivals and see these films grouped together by theme, what am I impetus to make something truly new or novel simply wither away? They want films like that, so I should make a film like that. It has been one of Keenet's ambitions since the beginning to part with this curatorial model and attempt as best we can to choose films which have merit on their own terms. In doing this, the through line connecting the films together becomes the fact of their localization and not any thematic or formal continuity shared between them. There is a feedback loop between what we decide as artistic value and the new kinds of art that can follow. Curation by theme narrows these possibilities for what new forms can emerge and makes repetition the order of the day. It is by changing our definition of curation that Keynote attempts to provide a space more attuned to the contemporary needs of experimental cinema. The theme is no theme, with radically different works hanging together in a constellation determined by nothing other than the fact that they are the best available. We feel that this relative looseness, or lack of thematic rigidity, is an absolute necessity for the development of future films. Because new films can't help but take the current consensus as a jumping off point, true progression in an art form can only be brought about collectively. A truly unprecedented work can never just come from without. In order to be unprecedented, there first need to be precedents. These precedents are set by the collective body of works we decide have value. Taken together, a group of films expresses something no single film can in isolation. But certain formal shapes and meanings emerging only in these works combination with them. The process by which this combined meaning is shaped and reshaped is never ending. The inclusion of a new film in the group changes what the group expresses. It is in this sense that localization can steer the progression of an art form, with the combined meaning of all of the films we collectively value playing a large role in determining what we think of as possible. Because any new film is always going to be is always going to respond to what came before it, it is essential that our standards be ready, readily adaptable to whatever these new forms may be. The collective form taken by cinema as a whole is what Keynet aims to nourish to help advance filmmaking to a new stage by providing the future with ample opportunity to emerge in the present. It's a difficult task and one that is full of contradictions at every turn, but we feel that in removing as many institutional limitations as we can and addressing the questions that arise in the process, we can make cinema as a whole more receptive to the exper experimentation it needs in order to progress. Screening underway, and then afterwards, Michelle will talk a little bit about the films themselves. Hi. Okay. So, thank you, Isaac. Um, despite the detail that Isaac just went into outlining our project, it's obviously super difficult to kind of impart what we're trying to do with description alone. We feel that a full understanding of Kina can only come from watching the film. I'll come back for a brief analysis and we'll start the program now. we have taken issue with directly by confronting certain tropes prevalent in experimental cinema today. I use the term subversion not because, or because it is not by simply ignoring the status quo that one changes it. In order to effect a change, we must alter the standards on our own terms, no matter how incorrect we take these terms to be. 
I'd like to start by talking a little bit about Douglas Dixon Barker's untitled camera roll and how it reacts to the elevation of celluloid that is popularized today. His film archives iPhone images that are 8 megapixels in size, which he then reprocesses into 35 millimeter film. The way the film cycles begins with fast cuts that join the center with harsh cuts to black, and this creates a strobing effect. The pace of the sequence starts to fade and the slow dissolves between frames. The pacing throughout the film calls to a familiarity of rapidly scrolling through images on our phones, feeds, a modern phenomenon. The sonic track further adds to this notion of the anomaly. The images are synced to a corrupted version of an ARCA track that came from their self-titled release in 2017. When the reviews of this album came out, all the press was mentioning a harsh noise track break at the center of the record, but in fact this was a mistake, it was a glitch. The approach of the film calls attention to stu two strategies in particular that are linked to visual art as far back as the 30s, but of course popularized in the digital age. The first is the glitch as a summation of errors. The second is collage, as a sort of pathless matrix of abbreviated moments. The processing of digital images in the celluloid in this case does not place emphasis on the quality of the celluloid. Instead, it agitates the image. So, while the celluloid is at the forefront of the image as a texture, we also know that it's a manipulated digital image with analog distortion. Another convention that has become popular in many avant-garde films today is to incorporate text within or on top of an image. Since a lot of experimental films to find narrative structures, subtitling or embedded text has sort of become a key signifier um, that link images together. In the beginning of Dylan Tachik's film, In Scent, No Subject, there is an establishing text about an unsustainable relationship that reads, we are at different points in our lives. The text then begins to vibrate towards illegibility. Sap comes in two-thirds into the film as a layer and begins to function as a sort of variation of graphic matching, which means when shapes and colors and overall movement match in composition between two shots. We see the text vibrate across the frame silently in the first minute of the film, and then mirror again in the sound. In the audio clips, we hear an edited version of DJ's Hell of a DJ, which features a voice that describes this idea of the divided soul. It's interesting that he adds this idea of the divide, and that the motions of the film are painful and destructive, not only in its affect for the viewer, but from the snippets of text we can read through out the film. The film suggests disparate realities. Montage moves relentlessly and obtrusively, and then the music drops in the film's climax by way of geometric and intricate cutting. The film sort of influences the viewer to investigate exactly what is being said in these messages for context, but ultimately we submit to its obscurity as artifice. This is something that the pioneer of avant-garde cinema, Hollis Frampton, characterizes as a modularity of misfortune, an omission. We view this as a prime example of a film subverting the contemporary expectations of the experimental film form, but on its own terms. Intelligibility is purposely left out. And in many of the films we see today, we see a priority towards exposition. We watched two films today by the filmmaker Kelly Dawn, and these films range from 10 to 20 seconds. I'd like to take a moment to discuss Late Embryo. Late Embryo is a 10 second montage composed of 300 frames of 56 photographs taken over 20 days. The form is an exercise of presence. Doug, or Dom compresses these frames into a span, the span of time it took for someone they were calling to pick up the phone, which resulted in 10 seconds. The film functions sort of as a mental note, but the images archived and its reduction does not subtract anything from the scale. We're reminded of the filmmaker Takashi Ito, an exceptional Japanese experimental filmmaker from the 80s who made rule-based films based off continuous stills and photographs. We often take frame rate as a given, seldom considering the mechanics that make motion pictures possible. Dom's film is not only self-reflexive in its form as an auto machine of memory or sensation, but it per further pushes its reflexivity into the realm of reanimation. 
They engage with the frame rate on a more intimate level. The timing of each frame is carefully selected according to the film's own concept rather than to a set frame rate. This introduces variability in an area of filmmaking that we usually don't see today. Jessica Johnson and Reiner Makora are a filmmaking duo from Vancouver. Um, they're currently based in Toronto, but if you could remember, their film Ocean Bills, I'm sure you observed, was very different from the rest. It was made in 2015, and it's an anthropological study of a colonial settlement built upon resource extrication. This film is a descendant of what many of us call slow cinema. It sweeps through abandoned spaces that were once home to over 3,000 people pushed out to create a facility to manufacture pulp. The architecture of the deserted structure serves as a window to overgrown vegetation. We admire the independent production of this film and its juxtaposition of historical truth versus aesthetics and its motive to call attention to the space. Nature, one subject to industrial force is re-represented and envisioned as an aesthetic focal point in colonial history. Yet rather than have a local or industrial function, the architecture's relationship to the land is presented in a more universal cinematic context. Alexander Galmard, a filmmaker we featured on Keenan, has a great analysis of Isaiah Medina's film, The Last One We Just Saw, It Is What It Is. And it's available on our uh, website, we have a film criticism vertical called Diopter. Um, I recommend you definitely to read it if you're interested in a more in-depth analysis of the film. But I want to highlight one observation that he made, and he calls this the bathroom divide. Galmar notes that these figures are already painted as decapitated, that they are torn from their respective bodies to represent their own inherent destruction the very fact that many of us do not fit in our own bodies. Medina is currently wrapping up the film adaptation for the Accelerationist Text Manifesto, Inventing the Future, which several of us Keenan collaborators have worked on. And he'll actually be joining us back here in December here at NYU to give a talk on philosophy and mathematics and how it relates to contemporary experimental cinema scene. We loosely view Miguel Manticon's Madman Wedding Remix as sort of a third act of a trilogy that we screened this summer at Spectacle Theater in Brooklyn. Um, we watched three films that he made between 2016 and 2018. These drift between diaristic image making, landscape filmmaking, and textual play. We see this film as a form of new documentary filmmaking. We see experiences of love, family, and communion at a sister's wedding, yet there's this rejection of understanding the way that he parses these images together. Earlier, Isaac spoke about how groups of films taken together can produce meaning that weren't necessarily in the films individually. A pretty literal example of this can be seen in the trailers that we make for our programs. Occasionally, there's a trailer style that we will be based on a formal aspect of one of the films and we'll apply it to the rest. For example, the trailer that we made to premiere the film that we just watched now was based on the Zotrope effect. By using a formal element of Miguel's film and applying it to the rest of the shorts, we created something new. This is also the case for the short intro and outro of the program that we watched today, which you may have noticed we played twice. Because of the way that frame rates quickly alternate, Playing it twice at its original speed results in certain shots being tied or skipped over. So the first trailer was 30 seconds and the second was 15. The change is dramatic. The rhythm and the content of the piece shifts. We're really fond of doing these kinds of edits for the films because we think it's a simple and direct example of how the localization of these films uh, benefit them. We believe in cinematic rendering and we think that this can make for new interesting forms to emerge. Um, we really hope that we have imparted some sort of interest towards how we are evaluating creating experimental cinema today. If there are any filmmakers or writers here with us today, we'd love to see what you're working on, as we always have open submissions on our website, Keynet Media.
And um, thank you to Jamie Stearns and NYU for inviting us here and providing the space. We'll be back here two more times before the end of the year, so we hope to see you then.